So that was a quote from a famous American president, Abraham Lincoln. And it talks about the best way to predict the future is to create it. And that's what we're learning. It's for all of us no, individually no to reimagine, rethink okay. that model okay, of healthcare in the future. What are these trends we talk about? What time are we well, to speak? Let's show you in terms of the technologies that are driving this change. What we're seeing are a number of technologies, what we call exponential technologies, whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, nanobiotechnology, genomics, 5G, mobile 5G, edge computing, cloud computing. We've seen artificial intelligence and deep machine learning all converging at the same point of human existence. We call it an inflection point for humanity. So we're now looking at this world of technology. And it's great to be in a hybrid event here to illustrate how we can be here face to face alive with a big audience and also be hybrid to share our skills and knowledge around the world. As you see, these technologies are all converging. And so what I'm telling you is not about one or two technology or is powered by 5G. It's that convergence that we're talking about. And to change your minds, we're going to show some more examples of that. So the first thing in terms of trend, it's going to be the way we design education for future generations. We've been slow at adopting change. We still have curriculums not designed for the future of mankind. Generation Z, people looking at new ways of learning, want to access information in a different setting. But I'm going to show you what I call Education 4.0. I remember the teacher talked and we listened. We had to memorize quite a lot too. A lot of time was spent giving out books and collecting them up again. We were sitting in rows in desks so we could see the board better because talk and chalk was the way. There must be an industrial revolution in education in which educational science and the ingenuity of educational technology combine to modernize the grossly inefficient and clumsy procedures of conventional education. Sydney L. Press, 1924. These young people are studying in a new way. A computing calculator designed for use in high school classrooms has created tremendous excitement among educators. The tool which has made this possible is the high-speed digital computer operating with electronic precision on great quantities of information. If we think about the third industrial revolution, that was PCs and the internet. And, and we've just about caught up with that. The fourth industrial revolution is what becomes possible from those technologies. Industry 4.0 is the next big shift in the way that manufacturing operates. Digital know-how is going to be hugely important and then people will need to be flexible because the world will change. At the future workplace and future societies, uh, we're still moulding them as we go and technology is one of the main pillars in what is shaping what the future will look like. The pace of change is remarkable. With the introduction of these exponential technologies, creating a paradigm shift to create Education 4.0. So we now defined this Education 4.0 in a different way of teaching the future generation of health workers. I'd like to share future virtual reality training created by Medical Realities.
So education is the first trend that's going to change. We've all been on Zoom, on Microsoft Teams, asking the question, is your mic on or is your mic off? Or indeed, are you online? But actually, online virtual education will be the part of our future. No longer will it require as many bricks and mortar to create the colleges, schools, universities of tomorrow, because hybrid education will be part of really the educational change that we will require. What it does, of course, it democratizes access to global education. The next trend is obvious. It's that of telemedicine. We've seen it last year. We've gone from face-to-face -face consultations to remote consultations. This image typifies the futurists of 1924. 100 years ago, people were thinking, can we see our patients using a different medium? You're talking about the radio doctor. In actual fact, they're predicting the application of telemedicine or telehealth. And last year, we've seen a plethora of companies working in telemedicine, offering you remote consultation. So we've seen 24-hour services come through where you can access a doctor through your smartphone through your computer, or even a telephone consultation. So we've seen the rise in telemedicine in the first three months of the pandemic up by 8,000%. Can you imagine? A year before that, we would have struggled to understand the value of remote medicine. But patients now are demanding access to healthcare that's easy, at their convenience, at their home, which changes the paradigm of healthcare. What about if we change the whole system of healthcare from secondary care to primary care to social care, making it much more seamless and actually moving healthcare from sick care in hospitals to well care in the community? That saves money, allows people to maintain their health and well being and uses resources much better. So you will see a transition from secondary to primary to social care. In fact, you might see these booths that kind of um, spring up across the world. This is in China, where you can pop into a cubicle, see a doctor remotely on telemedicine, have your blood pressure, your pulse, your ECG, your oxygen levels all measured in that um, small little environment. The doctor can then say to you, there's a diagnosis. Here's your prescription for medicines. You come out of the booth, you go next door with your smart card, you touch it, out comes your medicine and you walk away without relying on any primary care um, institution. You're just doing it all remotely and through these booths. And this, hopefully in the future, will take off as we speak. But it just exemplifies the use of telemedicine. People are really talking about artificial intelligence and deep machine learning as being a really powerful technology that's going to help us improve healthcare or access to health. When we look at AI, we think about the three words in this picture. It was the hope years ago that was saying we could revolutionize healthcare with AI. Then that was born by so much hype that it would change all of our lives immediately but it wasn't quite ready to do so. 2021 is going to demonstrate the word of reality. We are seeing now real time examples of AI will improve either automation, diagnostics, treatment pathways, and patient experiences. So it's a reality that 2021 will show you the actual effects of AI on a much larger scale. And actually what we're seeing a number of areas where AI is going to be useful for. What's important is to collect data. And now we're seeing big data science come in. We're collecting more and more data, which we'll explain in a moment. We talk about other trends in healthcare. And what we're looking at, different inputs into AI systems, whether it's natural language, whether it's patient data and biometrics, or indeed operational data from the providers. At the same time, the areas we're exploring are early, early detection or triage. Also, we're looking at diagnostics.
CTs, MRIs, images, etc. Looking at treatment pathways, managing them better, and of course looking at monitoring patients going forward. So there's a number of comes out there working on different pathways. What we're seeing now is the use cases in imaging, whether it's x-rays, CT scans, etc. We're seeing DeepMind, Google DeepMind, working on retinal scans, OCT scans, to predict retinal disease by using images. We've seen using pathology in skin diseases, analyzing skin lesions so that you can predict whether it's going to be a cancerous or not cancerous. So we're seeing a huge wide range of variation in the use cases of AI. And we play this video to show you my own specialty in surgery. This is a coloscopy. And what it's going to show you it's a polyp. A polyp is a precursor of cancer. Sometimes we miss polyps because they're quite small and they're hard to find. But this video, if you play it, will show you the kind of how AI can show you a very small lesion that you can't see with the naked eye almost. Here we are. The AI has now shown you an area of concern. As we go in deeper, concentrate in the area, suddenly at the end you'll see a small polyp. There we are which we hadn't seen before, just on the naked eye. So it allow us to be more precise, to improve the efficacy of these diagnostic tools. So we're seeing it used in ultrasound, we use it in different modalities now. The other trend I like to talk about is immersive technology, what we call extended reality. We have augmented reality on one side, where you wear a pair of glasses and overlay information it augments your reality. It's like a fighter pilot with a heads-up display. Virtual reality is the other end of the extreme, where we have a headset which we can't see out of, and you're immersed in a 360 environment. In the middle of that is something called mixed reality. And here we are. Here's a, a clip of video showing how can be taught using augmented reality using a simple smartphone, using either My AR core Annie. I'm super excited to give you an insight into the human heart. Choose from different conditions and see the effects right away on the hologram. That's a glimpse of what you can do with just a smartphone. What about if you then train in virtual reality? Surgeons around the world looking for new ways of learning. During the pandemic, we've seen there's been little contact for trainees in surgery. Now we're seeing VR education come in. We saw the video earlier of medical reality showing you the platform of learning. Now we're seeing simulation, practicing operations here, in this case, orthopedic surgery. So what we're going to look at now is Hi, how, we can, nice how we can combine these technologies to bring people together as avatars. This is my avatar. So the HoloLens itself really allows us to reshape the way we connect people, we communicate with people, and also to be used in teaching and training. Initially, when you put the HoloLens on, it feels a bit strange, but actually in a few minutes, it becomes quite normal. You feel as though you're just discussing cases with people in the same room, for example, like we do in normal hospital practice. We can come in and actually yeah. look at this content in full 3D. And obviously when you're working in, in this case, the medical field, having a full 3D understanding of a situation, for example, is really much more powerful in solidifying how you want to navigate it in your mind. So it showed you how we could convert this virtualization of healthcare using real time avatars. The next concept, next trend, is what I call digital surgery. We've known digital health as a concept for the past five to ten years. And now the last couple of years, we've got a new term called digital surgery. And my own profession of surgery is going to be completely reshaped by the use of these technologies. This is an image from the Dubai Futures Museum which will open in Dubai Expo 2020. It shows you the world of the operating theater, or the OR is going to change with 3D printing, 
with lasers, with images, with AI, with voice analysis, with computer vision. This is going to be the world of the operating theatre of the future. It sounds rather sci-fi, but actually it's becoming real. And 2021 will show you the reality of this new digital surgical world that we're living in. And this video shows you another element of that, which is another trend, robots. Surgical robots are coming in. We've had intuitive surgical with Da Vinci for the last 20 years. And now, in 2021, we're seeing a plethora of other robots coming in. Cheaper, more affordable, sleeker, more flexible, more nimble, smaller, more portable. This is one that shows you the intricacies of those technologies of robots. And there are many of those coming out. So robots will become the instrument of surgeons. Before it was a scalpel, which is now going to be replaced by a surgical robot going forward. And of course, that's one element. What if you could do robotic surgery remotely using 5G technology? 5G has a great bandwidth, up to 1 to 2 gigabytes per second download speeds, and a latency of 0.1 millisecond. Here we are, near some province in China, a surgeon doing remote surgery using 5G. He's in one part of the country, the operation part of the other. Now what we're seeing is more telementoring, teleproctoring, and remote surgery as we go forward. We'll also see the use of these technologies in the OR itself. What if you could navigate during an operation? You have a, a, an organ, say the liver, and you're taking out a tumour. What if you could navigate the, kind of the surroundings better to sub help you avoid damaging important structures or showing you that actually you're clear of the tumour or cancer itself? So, these kind of technologies are overlaying information. Surgical navigation tools are coming in as we speak. And they're not far-fetched. Some of these companies have got FDA approval to be used routinely in clinical practice. What about overlaying information further on brains or spinal cord, for example? So we can now have image analysis. We can overlay information in real time so you can now plan surgery better. So planning will change. Interoperative decision-making will change. And ultimately, this, all this data that's collected will allow surgeons to be more, I guess, accurate in their qualities, in the outcomes, um, in terms of the processes of the operation. So we're seeing all these kind of things happen. But then we talk about this world of avatars and holograms as a trend. We showed you an avatar earlier. What about holograms? I've given talks around the world as my hologram. I've appeared from nowhere remotely, gave a talk as my hologram, and disappeared. And the world of climate change, where airfare and air travel is going to be expensive for all of us, and we've seen during the pandemic, we can do things more virtually. And I've been talking for a number of years about how we should become more virtual, and hence they call me the virtual surgeon. Here's my hologram. Shafi, have a look at this. Yeah, let me have a look over your shoulder. Oh yeah, I see what's going on there. I think I'll give some advice, Carl. No problems, thanks for calling me. So that's my hologram, created from a number of cameras using mixed reality devices. And they're getting better and better when real time you could be a hologram. And I call this the surgical metaversity. Forget university, we're living a metaverse a virtual world in the future we can connect with the people. Here's my meeting that took place during the pandemic with my colleagues working in California. Hey, John, how's California? Hey, Shafi, it's really beautiful here. How's London? London's great. Should we have a virtual handshake? Yes, of course. What's uh, Avatar Medic? So we're providing new solutions for real-time remote medical relief whole new paradigm of telehealth. So that was me as my avatar with another person in California who's working with me in a virtual meeting. Soon, I'll be running my teaching sessions around the world, bringing students all around the world from different countries in this surgical metaverse. Why do you have to be in the same place, the same room? It makes no sense. It's too expensive and, of course, unaffordable. The trend continues. What about if you were propelled into space. By 2025, we're told by Elon Musk that we're going to Mars. 
there's a race on to go to Mars. We've seen recently the landing. We've seen a, now a drone coming out of that um, landing device and a helicopter will fly next couple of weeks across the, the land of Mars. So imagine as we push that, what could we do the remote medicine? Could we use avatars and robots to diagnose remotely? Hi Dorian, so nice to meet you. So I'm Dr. Dewberry and I'm here to take the neurology exam. I just need you to relax and just follow my instructions, okay? First thing I need you to do is to keep looking directly at my eyes and then follow my instructions. So this is the pen light and I'm going to shine it into your eyes now. Okay, keep looking at me. That's great. That's right. Good. Now I'm going to shine the light in the other eye, but keep just looking directly so at Remote my eyes. work. Going to right, Mars okay. or space is a great ambition for all of us, but then it also helps us with actually using that same technology in remote parts of Earth, helping us democratize education and democratizing healthcare that's available for everybody. The last concept is really replacing us entirely. We talked about avatars and holograms. What about digital humans? Could you replace me as a digital doctor completely using AI, empathy, deep machine learning? We are creating these digital humans, as you can see, using a process of photogrammetry, recreating models of new people. As we move forward, we'll see the digital human of tomorrow, of course. Here we are. This is like a, an avatar concept where you could remotely get a drone to fly across, giving support remotely going forward. What about if we use drones for other purposes? This is a video of a drone taking a transplanted heart, a heart ready for a transplant, across New York. So it could get to the hospital within a few minutes, as suppose a lot longer, helping salvage that transplant, going across a city. So all these are things you talk about, drones, holograms, avatars, where there's 3D printing, we're seeing amazing technologies now, where it's really revolutionizing what we can do. So to summarize, to finish, I've shown you a number of trends that are just here today, they also will be here tomorrow. I'm going to leave you with one final quote from William Gibson, who was a Canadian-American author who coined the term cyberspace. He often speaks about the future, the future that is already here, but it's just unevenly distributed. Yet. It's for all of us to redesign that and think how these technologies are going to revolutionize healthcare in the future. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to say that Professor Shafi Ahmed joins us live at Creating the Future. Shafi, hello. Hi, Ollie, and thanks for having me on, on, the, on the program. Well, thank you, except I'm a little confused. Is this the real Shafi or is this a hologram I'm seeing before me? <laughs> I'm not virtual, I'm real here. In the hospital. Thanks, Sally. <laughs> it's good because you've got your head in the next generation of tech, but your boots absolutely on the ground. Where are you this morning? And do you mind me asking? No, I'm at the Royal London Hospital, just having it at my face to face clinic, uh, back to doing normal duties again, of course. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you for all that you do. You have saved and changed lives around the world. And you've fired up the imagination of our guests already. Um, if you've got a question for Shafi, uh, you've got to be quite quick. We've got a few minutes together. Uh, Shafi, first question comes in for you. Um, it's quite a broad one. Which technologies most excite you about the future of virtual surgery? Which technologies um, are they? What, what do you guide us towards? Uh, it's a great question. I, I think ultimately it's about getting data that we haven't had before around the, the operation, the procedure, the outcomes, etc. And that, of course, means technologies like AI, uh, artificial intelligence, deep machine learning, with computer vision, will give us a whole barrage of kind of new data sets to work out, predict the outcomes, and also looking at quality uh, for our patients undergoing surgery. So I see robots also coming in. Uh, there's been a plethora of robots that are much more cheaper, more affordable, more flexible, more versatile. So we'll see robotics being more, more and more commonly used in the operating theatres around the world. So AI and robots and this computer vision giving us so much more uh, sophistication in the OR. Now, that's fascinating. So particularly on those data sets, what's the sort of information that you sort of love to get your hands on, but you can't so far? Just help us bring it to life a bit. What, what are you searching for? 
Well, surgery historically has been uh, using crude data of outcomes, length of time of the operation, deaths or morbidity after the operation, for example, or complications. If you look at visualization now, we can now almost add uh, augmentation to that field, adding information like a, like a fighter pilot with augmented reality. But also, of course, we can navigate through an operation. Imagine you do an operation, Ollie, and you're not quite sure where things are, and the computer helps you aid you with the anatomy, avoiding important structures, for example, yeah. showing you where the tumor is. That surgical navigation interoperatively would be fascinating to see how that will affect the outcome of the operation to make it more Phenomenal. precise. Yeah. Phenomenal. So Shafi Maverick Ahmed, I think. This is the new Top Gun of, <laughs> of surgery. I'm, I'm very inspired by this. So, questions are coming in quite quickly, actually. Um, how important is the air tightness of these operating theatres? That's quite a practical question for you. Uh, well, it's quite important, but we've done work in the past with these in terms of flows, how the flow should go through an operating theatre, etc. So the operating theatres now are very sophisticated. We've managed airflow pretty well, given which procedure you might perform, risk of infection, for example, or cross-contamination. So we're very happy with the, how the airflow is managed already. Yeah, good. OK, thank you for addressing that head on. How do we, this is a question from Anna Maria uh, Pilati. Thank you, Anna Maria. How do we navigate the real benefits of the technologies you describe in the context of our previous speaker's narrative about information warfare? And I suppose there perhaps our speaker is concerned about somebody hacking an operation, for example, heaven forbid. Yeah, and there's always a risk, of course, of and cyber security is going to be huge. And of course, the Royal London were affected by a um, virus only a few years ago, which brought everything crashing down. So we have to be aware of that eventuality. We have to take precaution. We have to insist that the systems are robust enough as we go forward. It's brought up to us to design those processes uh, in terms of the ethics, the confidentiality, the data that's required to make sure that we're sensible going forward. We are the, uh, I guess, the architects of our own future in that sense. And as clinicians, the data scientists and uh, healthcare providers, we need to manage regulation uh, in a way that uh, these new technologies bring them in are done in a sensible way that uh, is validated with good clinical data and science. Yeah. Excellent. Well, these questions keep coming, Shafi. We're going to go quite quick fire because we've just got a couple more minutes. 3D printing, a phrase we often hear. How do you hope to use 3D printing? And maybe just a super quick reminder about what we mean. This is bringing real objects to life uh, through a printing device. Uh, absolutely. So it had great promise a few years ago. 3D printing was the future we we're describing it. What we're seeing now it's being used for is, again, planning operation. For example, in orthopedic, uh, facial injuries, for example, or uh, reconstructing bones, for example, to plan those operations beforehand. We've seen that being used in real time, also for dentistry, uh, to do dental implants, for example. We're also seeing it for body organs, like the kidneys, the liver, to look at how, for example, a tumor might affect it, where the blood vessels are, et cetera, to plan those operations. Also for prosthetics. So new prosthetics could be designed by 3D printing. And as we go forward, I really see this future of regenerative medicine. Could we have in the future an artificial kidney, an artificial heart to replace transplant transplantation? We have huge problems with donors uh, coming forward, for example, for these transplanted organs. Could we actually produce our own with 3D printing in the future? And we've seen just elements of that recently with a 3D printed kidney and heart being just in, in, in very simplistic terms, trying to be replicated by 3D printing. So that's really exciting, the whole world of, of biology. <laughs>